Well, let's try a little video here. So, I'm Sammy Castanguay. I'm a geologist by training. And our tools in geology are things like rock hammers and boots and a nice brunt and compass. Maybe something like a, <clears throat> a stadia rod to measure some section and measure some rocks. And in this trade, we go outside and view these rocks and sometimes make geologic maps. Um, they're very colorful, rocks aren't color-coded, but we look at them to understand uh, the surface to make a map and then project that at depth so we can learn about the, the strata underneath the surface of the earth, uh, the crust, and uh, potentially even learn uh, more about the earth overall. It's by hundreds of years of doing that process of geologic mapping uh, which of course had its roots quite a bit different looking at rocks um, and <clears throat> applying that all over the globe with uh, of course geography and a lot of other sciences like geochemistry and geophysics we um, now understand the entire um, earth to a certain extent uh, scientifically so the geology um, being a science and going through the scientific process and uh, scientific method of inquiry we have now come to um, <clears throat> some major conclusions of understanding a whole lot about our Earth, uh, even things like the interior. Uh, and it's not hollow, <laughs> as this model or, um, of the Earth is. And models and maps are a great way to represent things that are at a really big scale that we don't understand. After all, how can you make a mountain range understandable to the human uh, brain? and all the rocks that that mountain range is made of. Uh, so in, of course, the trade of geology, we are obsessed with rocks, it seems. Um, looking at them all the time through our hand lenses, another tool uh, to look at the grains of those rocks very closely. You may recognize that as some nice piece of granite countertop, uh, which is a use for this science. Um, and it is geologic resources or stones and mineral resources as well as energy resources like oil and natural gas, coal, uh, and uranium, um, these types of earth resources have really dominated the um, industrial scene in the geologic sciences. But of course, being a science, it's not just application or industry focus. We are asking a whole broad variety of questions about the planet that we live on. Uh, speaking of the interior and some questions, the interior of the earth oftentimes in uh, textbooks is depicted as uh, red, and I imagine that's to show us or to represent to us in some way that it's hot. It's very hot in the interior as the earth was uh, built four and a half billion years ago from uh, meteors in the accretionary disk around our sun. Uh, the primordial heat of that accretion is still held within our planet. So yes, the mantle of the earth and um, <clears throat> so on is, is red or is uh, hot, but it is not the mineral that is red. Uh, there's a variety of colors of minerals and um, olivine and serpentine or the rock peridotite, which uh, we understand the mantle of the earth, the mesosphere is made of, is a green rock. And I think that's really fantastic. Uh, but what that rock looks like when it's green and under thousands of kilobars of pressure, we may not know. But on the surface of the earth, it's certainly a green rock. Um, other things that we uh, look at, of course, geologically, um, are beautiful samples and beautiful specimens. And it's uh, this beauty of the earth that really does help us um, understand all of what the earth is made of and its story through time. Uh, this is a sample from the Black Hills of South Dakota with big, beautiful micas and large uh, tourmaline or shoral minerals. Uh, the beauty of the earth, um, <clears throat> just like this green rock or the granite countertop that we use in our houses or this beautiful piece of uh, pegmatite with its large crystals is seemingly never ending. Um, rocks are just absolutely beautiful. There's lots of people who collect crystals or go rock hounding. Uh, but remember, we use these things, these beautiful rocks as resources. Remember that is um, uh, if, you will, uh, if you will, maybe the bread and butter of geology, as some say, um, in the past, that we are um, an extractive industry that's learning about these materials to um, 
in some ways be used to the benefit of, of humanity. And, and here's a great example of those. I've been uh, kind of taking these magnets and sticking them on here. Um, this is a banded iron formation. I was going to see if that makes it any better in the camera. Not really. But hopefully you can see the, the banding uh, of the black or darker minerals, which are magnetite. Uh, and the red um, jasper or chert um, minerals there, this banded iron formation, it's full of iron and these types of rocks formed two and a half to 1.8 or so billion years ago as the um, <clears throat> small cyanobacteria of the earth were beginning to populate the um, oceans of the earth and the atmosphere of earth with oxygen, a sus uh, material that we, as, as oxygen-breathing organisms, as well as most of the organisms that we know of, uh, of animals, of course, um, not plants that are photosynthetic, use oxygen. And uh, that story, the record of, of atmospheric oxygen increasing in our atmosphere, is written here in these types of stones that are so beautiful. And we also benefit a lot from these stones, besides the story of oxygen, uh, we, um, and, and silly little magnet fun tricks, this is a main iron resource around the world. It is the rocks of those time periods uh, where the oxygen was increasing and, and uh, iron was oxidizing and falling to the bottoms of oceans and depositing. It is those types of resources or geologic strata that of course uh, we've learned from geologic mapping that we can get out through mining that we use as a dominant iron resource around the world. Um, iron that is uh, the backbone to not only the, the Iron Age of um, the past, but the oil age of today, right? Uh, that we use so much iron for infrastructure and cars and of course um, everything. Then uh, this gigantic, beautiful crystal here um, is a piece of gypsum. Uh, the mineral gypsum is a, uh, an evaporate mineral that's left behind um, as uh, water becomes more and more alkaline and uh, calcium and sulfur increase in that alkaline water. Uh, and just look at the size of that crystal, of course, but look at the, uh, the sort of beautiful, almost translucence and uh, the shimmeriness or the quality called cleavage in minerals um, that this, this giant uh, crystal has. And this material um, you should also be familiar with as a resource to your life. Uh, this is the, the mineral gypsum is used um, in industry, of course, or in our lives as wallboard or as um, <clears throat> the uh, sheetrock and drywall, the things that are fire retardant that we put in our uh, wooden homes. Of course, they don't absolutely prevent fires and put out fires, but they're much less flammable than uh, just building a house from wood and they're, and they're insulating um, as well as um, structurally. They hold up pretty well and, and they're accessible. We've been able to, to learn about this through the surface mapping of the earth. And then again, uh, to find these locations and, and to mine some of these, like at the Blue Diamond Mine uh, to the west of Las Vegas um, that has a gypsum deposit there. And then stuff like this is pulled out. Even though this is not exactly what they're using, this crystalline uh, type of gypsum, they're using granular gypsum. Still, gypsum is... Uh, very similar to the house that you're living in. You're living, if you live in a, in a house with wallboard, you're living in a location that is literally made of, of crystals that are, that are this, of course, on, on small, very small sizes. Uh, and crystals are all around us. That is the rocks beneath our feet, of course, um, the solid ball of the earth all the way uh, to the middle. Of course, there's a liquid outer core that gives rise to our great magnetosphere. Um, but the, the earth is a solid mineral rock entity. And another um, wonderful thing that we have learned about our time here on earth is that uh, organisms, organisms like this mammoth tusk um, uh, from the Pleistocene era, just a mere um, two and a half to 11,000 years ago, the, uh, <clears throat> the glaciers or continental glaciers covered the, the northern hemisphere um, and of course, they left their remains behind and there were different styles of, of creatures that lived back then as evidenced by these things, fossils, uh, fossils of um, mammoths or even further back, uh, dinosaurs or even further back, things like uh, trilobites. And, and we've learned so much geologically uh, looking at this landscape and on all landscapes doing geologic mapping, looking at what the earth is made of and who 
used to live here and lives here, we've learned so incredibly much about the earth. And um, by, by looking around the earth, we've learned not only about the earth, but we've also, of course, employed different sciences in all sciences, chemistry, uh, physics, and astronomy. We've, we've not only taken our knowledge of this earth and the geology, but we, we look up at other planets, at other earths, at other worlds to learn more about our place in the cosmos and the place that our earth even fits into the cosmos. And we um, have learned such things that time, or what's called, referred to now, the Big Bang, of course, um, it's the best hypothesis that we have, the best theory that we, we know to explain all of these things around us. Um, over 13 and a half billion years ago, um, things expanded from an infinitesimally small point and um, have, have come to maybe the, the present day. And um, over that 13 billion years, of course, the Earth is only about a third of that age. It's only four and a half billion years old. And all of the geology and all the things that I've shown you here have only been in existence in less than that four and a half billion. Because things like the um, oxygen didn't come into, or the abandoned iron formations didn't come into the story until two and a half billion years ago. Or mammoths, they didn't come into the story until uh, maybe two million years ago during the Pleistocene Ice Age. Of course, maybe their proboscidean ancestors go deeper. And we, as Homo sapiens, didn't join this story until about 200,000 years ago. 200,000 years ago, uh, Homo sapiens, of course, had a long lineage of um, ape and hominidae ancestors. And this is what we might refer to as the geologic time scale or the universe time scale of the time that we've been around on this planet and in these cosmos, and we've become self-aware here. Uh, we've become self-aware as, as people, as consciousness and on the planet, uh, and the sciences have helped us understand all of this and all of this place. And what's so great about now is not only do we get to look back in our own past, in the past of everything around us, but we also stand on a precipice of looking into the future. And we know that our sun, the type of sun that it is, looking at else other suns of that size on the cosmos, has another five billion years of a lifespan to go. Okay? And that is just one more star in the cycle of stars that even made up our sun. One or two birth and deaths of stars that leads to the death of our star and then more and more. And the end of our universe we know little about. There are ideas and hypotheses. But this is my 12-minute inter interpretation, 13-minute interpretation of how geology fits into the grander scope of our lives, um, our place in the cosmos, and even, um, well, <laughs> any question you want to ask. It's about the rocks. All right.